and today, of course, some people think, well, you know, what relevance do folk tales have today? People think of them as being, you know, kind of anachronistic and reinforcing stereotypes and, and so on. But the fact is, and, and while in some cases that's true, because they've also, in many cases, instilled attitudes and prejudices in us that we, we work to, to sort of shrug off over the course of our lifetime, really. Um, but um, they're part of our cultural history. And the same way what we study all sorts of other types of history, we look at them to see, you know, what happened in the past, what the attitudes were in the past, what we can learn from them, and how to go forward and not repeat the mistakes of the past. So I'm really looking forward to some of the, some of the stories that we're going to uh, hear here tonight. Now, a few days ago, I did a promo for this event where I threw out a riddle, which was also a, a big part of sort of the, you know, homegrown entertainment here in Newfoundland and Labrador. And the riddle was, Flower of England, fruit of Spain, mixed together in a shower of rain. Put in a bag, tied with a string, riddle me this, and I'll give you a ring. And the big problem, of course, today with you know, throw out a riddle these days and everybody just rushes off to Google. It really is not within the spirit of, of how riddles are supposed to work. So, uh, but I said I'd give you the answer tonight. And the answer, of course, is what we would call, at least here in Newfoundland and Labrador, a doff, a pudding, a boiled pudding to go with your, with your jigs dinner. So uh, I'm gonna give you another riddle now, and I'm not gonna give you the answer, it's not even at the end of the night. Uh, Kaylee mentioned that you can write in at the end of the show. You can write in at the end of the show with your answer to this riddle, and you'll, you may win the door prize. We have a door prize, even though you don't have to come through any doors to, uh, to get here. And the riddle is this. I, I got this one, I was told this one by the late legendary Newfoundland fiddler, Rufus Ginchard, uh, quite a few years ago now, and he says, I haven't got it, and I don't want it. But if I had it, I wouldn't part with it for the world. What is it? So you think about that. I haven't got it, and I don't want it. But if I had it, I wouldn't part with it for the world. What is it? All right, let's get on with it here. And our first uh, storyteller this evening is Sharon King Campbell, a storyteller, theater maker, and writer based right here in St. John's. She's performed across the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, also in other parts of Canada, Ontario, British Columbia, and as far afield as Wellington, New Zealand, in fact. This is her fifth appearance at the St. John's Storytelling Festival, and we're really pleased to have her back with us, of course, tonight. Her solo storytelling theater hybrid show, Original, premiered in 2018, and uh, toured Newfoundland, Ontario, and Quebec earlier this year in what Sharon now fondly refers to as the before times. And I'm assuming that she's talking about the, the pre-COVID era uh, with that. But she's performing it live here in St. John's sometime next month at, uh, on the lawn at Government House. So if you're in the region, uh, you want to keep an eye out for that. And so you'll be able to actually go see the live version, which will be great. Uh, but we're really thrilled to have her here to perform for you tonight. So Sharon. Please welcome Sharon King Campbell. Sharon, take it away. Hello, everybody. My name is Sharon. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Kaylee. Thank you to the Storytelling Festival. Um, I'm going to start us off with a story that was collected in New England, um, but Newfoundland storytellers will recognize some aspects of this story. Here we go. A long, long, long time ago, there were three brothers Tom, Bill and Jack. And Tom, Bill and Jack lived with their grandmother and grandfather in a little farm in a little village, not too far from where you're sitting now. And Tom and Bill were strapping young lads, but Jack, who was the youngest and also the cleverest, was a very little, little boy. And so when Tom and Bill decided to go off and seek their fortune, Jack decided he was going to Oh, you can't do that, Jack, said his grandmother. You're too young, sure your grandfather and I will take care of you for another couple of years. Don't worry about it. And Jack said, thanks very much, grandmother, but I'm going. And his grandfather said, oh, come on, Jack, you can't go. Someone will eat you up for supper thinking that you're a turnip. And he said, thanks very much, grandfather, but warning is heated, I'm going. And so, because Jack possessed an imperviousness to instruction, that is particular to children of a certain age, his grandmother packed up enough lunch for all three boys, kissed them each on the forehead, and sent them off on their way. But before they left, 
they each took with them a keepsake. Now, you all know that keepsakes have a little bit of magic in them. But back in this day, everything magical was a little more magical than it is now. And so it was good form for the boys to take a keepsake. Tom, whose favorite childhood memories were of building the stone wall in the garden, took a little stone and put it in his pocket. And Bill, who used to love chasing around the chickens while his mother was trying to feed them, he snuck into the hen house, took out an egg, and tucked it in his pocket. And Jack, whose favorite thing to do was to climb the tallest pine tree on their property, look out over the hills, and imagine all of the great adventures he was destined for, he took a pine cone, tucked it in his pocket, and off they went. Well, the boys walked, and they walked, and they walked some more. And when the sun was high and they were starting to get a bit hungry, they sat down and had lunch. And because they were three growing boys, they ate up everything that their grandmother had packed for them. And so in the afternoon, they walked, and they walked, and they walked some more, and then it began to get dark. And then it began to get cold. And the boys were starting to be very hungry. And they were just about to despair when Jack caught sight of a light filtering in through the trees. And he followed that light until it became a lamp in the window of a house. And he said, well, Tom and Bill, someone is home. Let's knock on the door and ask if we can have supper and a place to sleep. And so Tom, who is the oldest and therefore the bravest, got up to the door and gave it three stout knocks. And a woman answered. A very old woman opened the door and said, what have we here? And just as Tom and Bill were opening their mouths to speak, Jack said, that's Tom and Bill, I'm Jack, we're seeking our fortunes and we'd like to stay here tonight, please. And so the woman said, well, I have two boys about your age. I'm sure they'd like the company, come on in. And they all sat down at the kitchen table and the other two boys were about the age and size that Tom and Bill were. And so the old woman laid a pot of soup in front of them, and her two boys caught hold of it and poured out so much into their bowls that by the time it got to the visitors, there was only a goopy slick of broth left over on the sides and one peppercorn, but it could have been a fish's eyeball. <laughs> well, the boys were very well raised, and so they politely ate up all of that soup and they didn't complain once, and they even avoided plugging their noses. And then it was time for bed. And the old woman said, well, my two boys sleep in the loft, and there's room enough up there for you guys, Tom and Bill. And Jack, while well, you're so small, you can sleep in my bed. I'll barely notice you're there. And she pulled out two white nightcaps, and she gave them to her own two boys, and she said, you two wear these nightcaps, and they'll keep you warm. And she pulled out two red nightcaps, and she gave them to Tom and Bill. And she said, you two wear these red nightcaps, and they'll keep you warm. And that was just strange enough that Jack had to take note of it. And they all went to bed, and soon the house was snoring. Or rather, the old woman was snoring, and no one else was really getting any sleep. But after a little while, the snoring stopped. The old woman got up. Jack opened one eye and watched her leave the room. She went into the kitchen, and from the other room, Jack could hear a sound. Shh, shh, shh. And so he got up to investigate. And he went out into the kitchen, and what did he see but the old woman holding the biggest knife he'd ever seen. It was as big as her arm. It was as big as Jack himself. He was shocked the old woman could hold it up. And she was sharpening this knife. And Jack was very still. And after a while, the old woman set out for the stairs to the loft where Jack's brothers were sleeping. While Jack crept silent as he could over to the front door, gave it three stout raps, and fell back into a shadow so he wouldn't be discovered. The old woman, 
who was at the top of the stairs, stomped her way back down the stairs, laid down the knife, opened the door, stepped outside, and she looked to the left. And she looked to the right, and she looked out into the woods as far as she could see, which was pretty far. And there was nothing there but the breeze in the trees. While she was outside, Jack snuck up the stairs, and by the time the old woman had closed the door and grumbled to herself about an unfounded accusation about teenagers knocking on an old lady's door and running away, well, he had switched the nightcaps so that Tom and Bill were wearing the white ones, and then he hid under the bed. The old woman came up the stairs with that knife shining in the moonlight, and with one great blow, she cut off the two heads in the red nightcaps. And then she went off down the stairs, laughing evilly to herself. Well, Jack was terrified. And he woke up his brothers, and they all escaped out the window, down the wall, and off into the woods as far as their, as fast as their feet could carry them. Well, the old woman got back into bed, snickering to herself, imagining all of the delicious meals she would cook with that fresh meat she'd just acquired. And then she realized Jack was not in the bed. And so she got up and she went back out to the loft and she found one empty bed with two white nightcaps strewn on it. And the bodies of her own two boys, whose heads she had cut off, her very self. Well, she let out a witchly scream, because I'm sure by now you've all gathered that this woman is a witch. She let out a witchly scream and she set up herself to track those boys. Well, I'm sure you all know there are three things any self-respecting witch will have with her while she's chasing innocent children through the woods. The first is a great black cloak with a pointy hood, which besides being fashionable, carries with it most of her power. Second, she has seven mile step boots. Every witch has a pair of seven mile step boots. What they do is allow you to walk seven miles in a single step, 14 miles in two steps, 21 miles in three steps, etc. You've all done your times tables. Third is the bag of gold. Now every witch has a magic bag of gold. There's always enough gold in it. No matter how many times you empty it out, there's always more gold. She is not going to leave that unattended. It's going to be with her wherever she goes. So she put on her cloak and she pulled on her boots and she picked up her bag of gold and off she set. And at seven miles a step, it didn't take her very long to catch up to the boys. And just as she was reaching out her fingers, Jack looked at Tom and said, Tom, throw down your keepsake. And Tom reached into his pocket, took out the stone, threw it down and on the ground in between him and the witch, and a great stone wall appeared. Good stout wall, three feet thick. It reached up to the sky and down into the center of the earth, and it reached out as far in either direction as any of them, even the witch, could see. And the boys took off running. Well, the witch opened up her cloak and she called out, all the animals in the world, all the animals in the world, come to me now, for I have need of you. And every animal in the world came to the stone wall. And she said, bore me a hole through this wall big enough for me to get through. And despite their better judgments, and because they had been commanded to do so, every animal in the world started to bore that hole. They knocked at the wall with their antlers, they scratched at it with their nails, they gnawed at it with their teeth until there was a hole big enough for the witch to squeeze through. And she stepped seven miles, seven miles, seven miles, and pretty soon she was on the heels of those boys again. And Jack turned to his brother Bill and said, Bill, throw down your keepsake. And Bill reached into his pocket, pulled out his egg, threw it down on the ground between himself and the witch, and from that point sprung a huge sea of egg. It was 21 miles across, and it reached out as far in either direction as any of them could see, including the witch. And the boys took off running. Well, 
The witch opened up her cape and she said, all the animals in the world, all the animals in the world, come to me now for I have need of you. And all the animals hobbled over from the stone wall where they'd just been. And she said, lick me a path through this sea. And so, against their better judgment and because they had been magically commanded to do so, every animal in the world started to eat up the egg. They ate egg for hours and hours until eventually the witch, having lost her patience and wanting to exact revenge immediately, waded through the last little bit of egg, gumming up her seven mile step boots in the process so they were only half effective. But once she got to the other side, three and a half miles a step, three and a half miles a step, three and a half miles a step, it wasn't too long before she caught up to the boys. And Jack, reached into his pocket, pulled out his pine cone, threw it on the ground in front of him, and out of that spot sprang a huge pine tree, the biggest tree they'd ever seen. And the boys climbed up as high as they could into that tree. And the witch arrived at the bottom and looked up and laughed to herself. And she reached into her cape and pulled out a pudding bag. And she looked up into that tree and she said, Tom, jump down into my pudding bag now because I command you to. And without even time to think, Tom threw himself out of the tree straight down into the pudding bag flop. And the witch looked up to the tree again and she said, Bill, jump down into my pudding bag now because I command you to. And without time for thought, Bill found himself jumping out of the tree into the mouth of the pudding bag, flopped right down on top of his brother, and the two of them were trapped. And the witch looked up to the tree again, and she said, Jack, jump down into my pudding bag now because I command you to. And Jack, who possessed an imperviousness to instruction particular to children of his age, grabbed hold of that pine tree as hard as he could and said, nope. And the witch said, listen, Jack, I'm commanding you, jump down into this pudding bag this minute. And Jack clutched the tree closer and said, not gonna. And so the witch, at her wit's end, said, listen here, Jack, this is not a game. I'm gonna start counting. And if I get to three and you're not in my pudding bag, there's gonna be big trouble. And Jack said, you're gonna have to come up and get me. And so she did. She took off her cape, folded it carefully, laid it at the foot of the tree. She took off her boots, sat them right next to her cape. She put down her bag of gold and she started to climb. And as the witch was climbing one side of the tree, Jack stamped her down the other side, put on that cape, dumped his brothers out of the pudding bag, looked up into the tree and said, Granny, jump down into this pudding bag now because I command you. And without even a chance to think, the witch jumped right out of the tree into her own pudding bag and Jack tied it closed. And he and his brothers picked up the pudding bag with witch, the magic cape, the magic boots. They took them to the nearest river, they dumped them in where they were carried out to sea and never seen or heard from again but the bag of gold they carried home to their little farm in their little village to their grandmother and grandfather. And because the best thing about a magic bag of gold is that it is never empty, they started a charitable organization and they made sure that they and everyone in their village and indeed everyone they ever met lived comfortably ever after. Thank you so much, Sharon. And uh, for those of you who perhaps who are from outside of the province and not necessarily used to Newfoundland folk tales, the, the Jack tales really make up a fairly significant chunk of, a, it's, it's kind of a genre unto itself, really. Uh, quite, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever made an accurate count of them, but there are tens, maybe even a hundred or more Jack tales that have been collected from around the coast of, uh, of Newfoundland. Here in, on the island of Newfoundland, of course, the island of Newfoundland is the 16th largest island in the world. And combined with Labrador, we have over 17,000 miles of coastline. 
So you might uh, understand that, you know, boats have played a very big part of our, uh, in our history here. We have a, a tremendous uh, seafaring uh, history. And we've used a lot of different kinds of boats over the, over the course of uh, history in Newfoundland. The one I'm going to talk about is a little rowboat called a punt, perhaps eight or ten feet long and a, and, a, and a set of paddles. And it was a, a fairly well used boat in the part of the province where I came from. Now if you go out to, you know, through the narrows here in St. John's, you're immediately out in the wide North Atlantic Ocean. And there's a lot of places around the province where that in fact is the case. As soon as you leave the harbour and get beyond the headlands, you're out in the open sea. But where I grew up, there was a lot of protected waterways, the lots of islands, coves, inlets, and so on. So the water, the salt water was quite a bit calmer and you had perhaps an hour or more steam really to get out to the, to the, wide, uh, to the wide Atlantic Ocean. And consequently, a lot of the people who fished there were known as inshore fishermen because they didn't have to go all the way out to sea like the, the same way that the deep, deep sea fishermen did. And consequently, they could row out in their punt to uh, you know, to their lobster pots or their cod traps, their herring nets or what uh, what have you, um, and be back on the same uh, on the same day. Now, because we had so much protected water, it was a lot calmer inside. So the uh, harbors would all freeze over during the winter, and then of course the Arctic ice, the pack ice, would come down later in the winter and really keep pretty much keep navigation closed until you know sometime uh, sometime late uh, in the spring. So consequently, when at the end of the fishing season, the fall of the year, everybody would haul their punts or their fishing boats up into the beach, leave them there for the winter, and then when the spring rolled around, well, perhaps they'd go down and put a lick of paint on the punt, perhaps chink it up with a little bit of oakum, and she was all ready to be, uh, to be going fishing and again the following spring. Now, as was always customary in Newfoundland in the old days, if a family was a fishing family and they had sons, well, their sons would go into the fishery with their father. And when their father would retire from the fishery, well, then his sons would naturally take over his, uh, his fishing enterprise, including his stages, his cod traps, his herring nets, salmon nets, and of course, the punt. Now, there was just such a family that lived just right fair across the harbor from where I grew up. In fact, myself, my sister, and my brothers, we used to cross the harbor ice during the winter. We'd walk across the ice to go to school. And we'd come ashore on the other side of the harbor, right next to their fishing premises. They had three sons, all of whom went into the fishery with their father. And when their father retired, the three boys took over his, his fishing enterprise. And uh, one fall, they hauled their punt up into the beach and they left her there for the winter. Now, it was a miserable old winter that winter. The ice was in and out of the bay a dozen times, great big chunks of it hauled up into the beach. And when the three lads went down into the beach to get their punt ready to go fishing, they discovered that the ice was after doing a lot of damage to their old punt over the course of the winter. And she really wasn't seaworthy enough to be going fishing in this particular spring. So they decided that in order to prosecute the fishery this year, they were gonna to have to build themselves a new punt. And in order to do that, they were gonna to have to go back up in the woods, cut some timbers and drag them out into the beach so they could build the punt. Now the oldest boy, whose name was Tom, said to his two younger brothers, he said, boys, he said, uh, I know it's a good spot, he said, for cutting timbers. So he said, I'll go up in the country tomorrow, he said, and cut some timbers. He said, and I'll drag them out, he said, and we'll build ourselves a pond. So his two younger brothers thought that was an excellent idea. So, so Tom goes off to his mother. Mother, he says, bake us up some lassie buns, he said, because I'm going up in the country tomorrow to cut some timbers for a pond. So his mother baked up the buns for him. And the next morning off goes Tom, buns in his grub bag over his back, ax in his hand. And when he got up in the woods to a place where he knowed was a good spot for cutting timbers, he was feeling a bit tired and a bit hungry. So he lit a fire and he sat down and boiled his kettle. And just as Tom was about to crack in now on the lassie buns that his mother had baked up for him the night before, out of the woods comes this old witch. And in a nice way, she asked Tom for a bun. How are you getting our bun here, said Tom. I only got enough for myself. Oh, that's all right, Tom, said the witch. That's all right, she said. You get your reward, she said. The old witch went on back in the woods again. Now, when Tom finished his lunch, he doubted his fire. He put away his things in his grub bag, and he picked up his axe to go cut his timbers. But every time Tom's axe had struck the tree, Tom would bring up standing. 
because every single tree in the forest was made of solid iron. And Tom had to go home without any timbers for his punt. So he told his younger brother, Bill, about how the witch had come out of the woods and put a spell on him. And Bill said, I'll go on with you, Tom, he said. I'll go up in the country tomorrow, he said. I'll bet you, he said, I'll be able to bring home some timbers for a punt, he said. So Bill goes off to his mother. Mother, he says, bake us up some lassie buns, he said, because I'm going up in the country tomorrow to cut some timbers for a punt. So his mother baked up the buns for him. And the next morning off goes Bill, buns in the bag, axe in his hand, and sure enough, as soon as ever Bill sat down to have his lunch, out of the woods comes the old witch, and she asked Bill for a bun. How you getting our bun here, said Bill. I only got enough for myself. Oh, that's all right, Bill, said the witch. That's all right, she said. You'll get your reward, she said. The old witch went on back in the woods again. So when Bill finished his lunch, he doubted his fire, he put away his things in his grub bag, and he picked up his ax to go cut his timbers. But every time Bill's ax would strike a tree, there were shards of glass went flying everywhere because every single tree in the forest was made of glass, and Bill had to go home without any timbers for his punt. So he told his younger brother Jack about how the witch had come out of the woods and put a spell on him. And Jack said, I go on with you boys, he said. Nothing wrong with ye, he said. Don't you too lazy to cut a few timbers for a punt, he said. I'll go up in the country tomorrow, he said. I guarantee you, he said. I won't be coming back until I got timbers for a punt. So Jack goes off to his mother. Mother, he says, bake us up some lassie buns, he said, because I'm going up in the country tomorrow to cut some timbers for a punt. So his mother baked up the buns for him. And the next morning, off goes Jack, proud as punch. Buns in the grub bag over his back, axe in his hand, and sure enough, as soon as ever, as ever Jack sat down to have his lunch, out of the woods comes the old witch, and she asked Jack for a bun. Sure, said Jack. <laughs> you can have two if you want some. So the old witch sat down and had a lunch with Jack. And while they were polishing off the lassie buns now that Jack's mother had baked up from the night before, the old witch asked Jack what he come up in the country for. And Jack said, well, mate, he said, uh, the ice is after going out of the bay now, he said. Me and me brothers, he said, we're trying to get ready to go fishing again this spring, he said. But the ice got our old punt all uh, beat up the winter, he said. So I come up in the country, he said, to cut a few timbers so me and me brothers can build a new punt to go fishing in again this spring. And the witch said, sure, Jack, my son, she said, that's all right, she said. You haven't got to worry about the like of that, she said. Sure, I'll look after that for you. I'll tell you what to do now, Jack, she said. Take your axe, she said, and go up in the woods there, she said, and cut me a timber. And when you comes back, she said, I'll have your punt all timbered out for you. So Jack took his axe, and he goes up, and he cuts a timber. And sure enough, when he comes back, here's the punt all timbered out in front of him. And the witch said, Jack, she said, uh, go up and cut me a plank stick now, she said. And when you comes back, she said, I'll have your punt all planked out for you too. So Jack goes off and he cuts a plank stick. Sure enough, when he comes back, here's the punt all planked out in front of him. Well, Jack looks at the punt, he says, uh, beautiful punt, he said, which? Beautiful punt. But now he said, how am I going to paint her? Oh, don't worry about that, Jack, my son, said the witch. And she reached into her pocket. And she hauled out this great big paintbrush, my son, what a paintbrush. She said, Jack, she said, you take your paintbrush now, she said, and you give your punt a smear down one side, she said, and a smear up the other. And that punt, she said, will be seven different colors. So Jack took the paintbrush, he smeared her up one side, he smeared her down the other, and sure enough, that punt was seven pretty colors, the most beautiful punt that Jack ever laid eyes on. So Jack was standing there looking at the punt. He said, uh, fantastic job, he said, which, fantastic job, he said. But now he said, here we are, he said, way up in the woods. He said, there's not a drop of water in sight. He says, how am I supposed to get me punt out of this place? Oh, don't worry about that, Jack, my son, said the witch. She said, you get aboard of your punt now, she said, and I'll tell you how she works. So Jack jumped aboard the punt. He sat down on the top. And the witch said, now, Jack, my son, she said, is like this. She said, if you wants to go anywhere in this punt, she said, all you got to do is say the magic word, fly. 
And she said, this punch, she said, will take you anywhere in the world you wants to go. And she said, if you wants to stop somewhere, she said, all you got to do is say the magic word, pitch. And she said, that punch, she said, will land you anywhere you wants to. Well, Jack was anxious to get back home now so him and his brothers could start their fishing season. So he shouted at the top of his voice, fly, he said. Oh, the punch started to rock back and forth on the ground. Up she comes, up off the ground, up over the witch's head and off into the clouds and out of sight. Well, Jack was soaring along, having the time of his life. And by and by, the once he figured, well, he must be getting pretty close to home now. So he says, pitch, he says. And down she comes, sir, as smooth a landing as ever you could imagine. Now, Jack wasn't on the ground in that point very long before he realized he wasn't on the northeast coast of Newfoundland anymore after all. He was after going clear across the Atlantic Ocean and landing over in England. And the very first person that Jack laid eyes on when he got out of his punt in England was the king's daughter. And pretty soon the princess took an awful shine to Jack. And it wasn't very long after that before they decided they were going to get married. Now the king didn't mind, you know. Oh no. The king was awful tickled with Jack for having such a beautiful punt. So as the wedding day approached, Jack goes up to the princess and he says, you know, princess, he says, before we can get married, he said, I'm going to have to go home and see me brothers, he said, because they must be getting awful uneasy about me by now. And the princess said, yes, Jack, my darling, she said, you go home and see your family, she said. And when you're ready, she said, you come back and we'll be married. So Jack jumped back into the punt. He shouted, fly. And in a twinkling, he's back on the coast of Newfoundland. Well, now Jack brings that beautiful multicolored punt in over the horizon. First thing he sees, there's Bill and Tom still waiting there in the beach for Jack to come out of the woods with a few timbers so they could build a punt. And when Jack brought that punt into the cove, well, his two brothers could hardly believe their eyes. And when Jack told them the story about how the witch had built the punt, he was after being to England, he was going to marry the princess and become a wealthy man. Well, they could hardly believe their ears either. And they became extremely envious of Jack. And they thought, well, I mean, if we had a punt like that, we could probably travel the world too. Well, perhaps we could marry a beautiful princess and become wealthy men too. So they decided to ask Jack for a loan of his punt. And Jack, being an easy going sort of fellow, said, yes, boy, he said, sure, he said, you can have a loan of me punt, he said. So the two brothers jumped into the punt. How does she work, Jack? How does she work? Jack said, now, boys, he said, it's like this, he said. If he wants to go anywhere in this punt, he said, all you got to do is say the magic word, fly. Well, the two brothers shouted at the top of their voices, fly, they said. Oh, the punt started to rock back and forth on the ground. Up she comes up off the ground, up over Jack's head and off into the clouds and out of sight. And I guess they're flying yet. Because these two brothers were not anxious to get going. They never waited for Jack to tell them the magic word pitch. So one of these fine clear nights, you happen to be looking up in the sky and you see something going across the sky and you don't know what it is. Well, now that's probably Bill and Tom up there in Jack's magic punt trying to figure out a way to get back down on the ground. Jack waited in the beach a long time for his two brothers to come back with that punt because he was anxious to go back to England to marry the princess but they never came back. Jack even went back up in the woods to see if he could find a witch to get her to build him another punt, but he couldn't find her. Now, fortunately, the princess was a woman of much greater resources than Jack. So she came to Newfoundland and they got married here, out there on the Northeast coast. They had the biggest kind of a wedding, my son, with the big dance afterwards. And they laid on a huge feast, which they spread out on a great big tin table. But the tin table bended. So my story is ended. Now, if the table had been stronger, my story would have been longer. And if they don't have good luck, well, then may all ye. That's the story of Jack and the Magic Punt. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, let's move on to our next uh, guest uh, teller. I'm uh, really pleased to be able to introduce you to Catherine Wright, although many of you, I'm sure, 
are aware of her and have met and heard her tell stories before. Uh, Catherine grew up in Newfoundland in a very creative family where self-expression was encouraged. From an early age, she made stories where there were teddy bears, toys, rocks, and anything else that was to hand. Catherine continues to embrace playfulness, creative exploration, and discovery in her roles as a mother, an arts educator, a multidisciplinary performer, and a creator of silkworks. Her telling of folk and fairy tales, personal stories, and original tales are often interwoven with movement and song. Catherine is presented at many, many venues and events for audiences from preschoolers to seniors. She is currently president of the St. John's Storytelling Festival Incorporated, and the Provincial Representative for Storytellers of Canada. Please welcome Catherine Wright. Hi. Uh, there you are. It's good to see all your faces there this evening. Um, I'm going to start with a little song because uh, guess what? I also have a Jack story planned for this evening. It seems to be an evening of Jack tales, although it wasn't planned that way. But um, just to have a little segue from one jack tale to another. This is a little bohemian fairy story uh, song. If I were a tiny elf and just as high as a fly, I would creep into a flower there to lie. I would watch from out my window bumblebees in the breeze buzzing by among the grasses tall as trees. Safe from giant toad and sparrow I would keep hidden deep till the summer wind would blow me fast asleep. So I'm also going to tell you a jack tail, and there are many jack tails in this province, but of course these jack tails um, have their origins in many other places, and as you will hear from this story, uh, there are similarities probably to other stories that you have heard before. And in fact, um, I have just discovered a Scottish fairy tale, which I would have told you tonight, but it's very, very long. So I'm going to have to uh, find a good time to tell that one. But it has a lot of similarities to this story, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so here we go. There was once a good woman, and she was worn beyond her years, raising her three boys. And all they had was a bit of land, and a few chickens, and a cow. Now the three sons, their names were Tom, Bill, and Jack. Tom, the eldest, he could not wait to get away from home. And so one day he said to his mother, Mother, roast me a hen and bake me a bun. I'm off to seek my fortune. Oh, now, Tom, she said, Tom, don't be going now. Something terrible might befall you. Mother, don't be going on. I'm leaving and that's that. And away he went. Well, he walked and he walked and he walked and he walked and finally he came to a pond. He was mighty hungry by now. So he sat down on a rock and no sooner had he taken out his bun of bread, but a little bird came and pitched on his shoulder. Tom, Tom, said the little bird, give me a crumb that falls from your mouth. And that's what I want, said Tom. He flicked off the bird and it flew away. Well, he ate up his bun, but when he leaned in to get a drink from the pond, well, it wasn't fit. It was muddy, it was gasoline, it was whatever awful thing Tom could imagine. And so he didn't have a drop of it. And he went on his way again. And he walked and he walked and he walked all night. And finally, he came to the town that was nearest where their little farm was. And in this town, there was a castle and in the castle lived the king. And he went right up to the door and he rapped on the door. And the butler came to the door. Have you got any work, said Tom. Well, said the butler, the king wants someone to take his cows to the field. Can you look after cows? 
indeed I can, says Tom. Well then, take the cows to the pasture, but you mark my words, if anything should befall any of them cows, you'll be in trouble. Oh, no problem, says Tom. And so he takes the cows to the pasture. And when he gets there, there's this tree. And there's a crook in the tree. And so Tom climbs up into the crook of the tree and he settles in. And being rather tired from all that walking, he falls fast asleep. Well, no sooner is he asleep than a three-headed giant comes into the field. He comes clomping his way through and he's scooping up the cows in his arms and making off with them. And when Tom woke up, some of the cows were gone. Oh my, says Tom, oh my, oh my, what am I going to do? Well, hopefully the king won't notice. So he takes the cows back to the king. Oh, the king was livid. He sent Tom to the dungeons. And so Tom never came home. Time went by. Bill thinks to himself, well, sure, I can do better than Tom. And he goes to his mother and he says, mother, Roast me a hen, bake me a bun, I'm off to seek my fortune. Oh, now, says Bill. Oh, Bill, no, she says. No, you know, you know, Tom never came back, and sure, you may never come back neither. Mother, I'm going. And so away he goes. Well, the same thing happens. He comes to the pond, down comes the bird. He won't give it a crumb, drinks the water. Oh, it's awful. He goes on his way, comes to the town, knocks on the door, takes the cows, climbs into the tree, falls fast asleep, and in comes the three-headed giant, scoops up the cows, and away he goes. And doesn't Bill end up in the dungeon too? Time passes. No Tom, no Bill, they don't come home. Now Jack is the youngest. And Jack, well, he's one of these guys who, he's always there, he's always helpful. Mom loves him dearly. He's the kind of guy who'll say, Mom, now you put up your feet. I'll put on the kettle and we'll have a cup of tea. And they'll sit down together and have a grand old chat. And so one day when Jack says to his mother, now mother, he says, if you can spare it, roast me a hen now and bake me a bun. I'm gonna go and see if I can find Tom and Bill. Well, his mother, oh no, Jack, no, she says, why, if anything happened to you, oh, I don't know what I'd do, I couldn't bear it. Now, mom, he says, and he gives her a little kiss on the top of her head, and a little snuggle, he says, now, mom, I promise I'll be back, you'll see. And away he goes. So he walks and he walks, and in time he comes to the same pond and he sits down on the rock and he takes out of his bun, his, his bun of bread. And doesn't that same little bird come down and pitch on his shoulder? Jack, Jack, it says, give me a crumb that falls from your mouth. Oh, I can do better than that, says Jack. And he takes his bun of bread and he breaks it in two. And he gives the bigger half to the little bird. And it picks up the bread and flies off. And now when Jack leans in to have a drink from the pond, oh. It is the most pure, refreshing water, or perhaps wine, or champagne, or a martini, whatever Jack might like it to be. And he drinks his fill, and he is refreshed, and he goes on his way merrily enough, whistling a little tune. It's getting dark, and he's walked a long time. He's tired, and he sees up ahead a little light glowing at a window. So he goes over and he knocks on the door. And a woman comes to the door, she opens it up and she looks at Jack. And Jack's got 
twinkly eyes and he's got a merry smile and curls, you know, and he looks really friendly. And she says, uh, yes. And he says, I'm looking for somewhere I can just lay my head for a bit. May I come in and have a little rest? She says, yes, yes, you, you come, come in. Yes, come in. But she said, now, I'm just the servant, she said. And my master now, he, he's quite a dreadful sort, you know. He's a three-headed giant. And as you can probably smell, I'm just roasting up some cows there now for his supper. And he'll be here any minute. So now I'm going to hide you away, Jack. And don't you look out, no. Don't you be seen. But once he's finished eating his meal now, he'll fall asleep. And then you can come out and go on your way. Okay, Jack? Yes, Jack says, I can do that. So he comes in the house and she hides him away. And he has a little rest. And soon, sure enough, in comes the three-headed giant. <laughs> Woman, he says, woman, have you got my meal ready? Oh, yes, she says, it's right here. And she brings him plate after plate after plate for his three heads. And he starts to snarfle up his meal. And after a time, he is full. And he starts to yawn. And he falls asleep. And at that moment, she says, now, Jack, this is your chance. Come out. So out comes Jack from his hiding place. She brings him outside. She brings him a little extra chicken, just or not chicken, roast beef, to give him a little bit of something to eat on his journey home. And she says, now, Jack, she says, I can see that you're a really nice fella. And I want to do something special for you. And so she pulls from her pocket of her apron a ball. And she says, this is no ordinary ball. This is a magic ball, Jack. And she gives it to him. And she says, when you need it, you just have a thought. And you throw it. And, well, it'll take you where you want to go. Well, Jack is very thankful. And he says, uh, that's very kind of you, Mrs. And, and he says goodbye, and, and he goes on his way. So he takes out the ball, and he has a thought, and he throws the ball. And in very short time, isn't he standing in front of that same castle? And he knocks on the door, and the butler comes to the door. Uh, good evening, sir, says Jack. Um, I'm looking for my brothers, Tom and Bill. Have you seen them? Oh, them, says the butler. Sure, they're down in the dungeons. Oh, says Jack. Well then, uh, do you have any work for me? Well, said the butler, can you look after cows? Yes, I can look after cows. All right, he says, then you go to the pasture, you take the cows. But if you lose one single one of those cows, it's to the dungeon with you as well. And so he takes the cows out to the fields. And there is the tree with the crook. And he climbs up into the tree and he sits himself down. Now, from up here, he can see far and wide. And so the moment that the three-headed giant enters the field and starts to go for the cows to scoop it up, he calls out, hey, those are not your cows. Those belong to the king. <gasps> well, the three-headed giant looks at Jack nothing more than a youth sitting up in that tree. He says, yeah, and who's going to stop me? And so Jack takes from his pocket the ball. He has a thought, and he throws the ball at the three-headed giant. It hits him in the middle of one of his heads, and he keels over, dead on the ground. And now Jack comes down from the tree, and he goes over, and he takes out his pocket knife, and he cuts the tongue out of each of the heads 
of the three-headed giant and he puts them into his pocket which i guess was a really big pocket and then he took up all the cows he gathered them together and he brought them back to the village to the king well the king was really pleased he said jack my lad you've done well you can keep that job and jack said thank you very much and it was a good thing because he had to have some time to figure out how he was going to get Tom and Bill out of that dungeon. Time went by. And Jack got to notice how the king had a really beautiful daughter. And then news came that there was a terrible, fiery serpent coming along the coastline. And the only way that that terrible fiery serpent wouldn't kill off the whole village was to sacrifice the princess. The king sent out a proclamation. If any man could come and kill the fiery serpent before it gobbled up the princess, well then, he would be rewarded with gold and silver, with the marriage of his only daughter, and eventually he would rule over the whole kingdom. But a fiery serpent is not a thing most men or women would wish to deal with. But Jack, now Jack, he started thinking. And when the day came, for the fiery serpent to arrive and the princess to be sacrificed. He watched and he waited. The princess in all her finery was sent down to the beach and there she was left alone. The only witness to this terrible feat would be the old butler who went up safe up on the headland to watch. But down comes Jack to the beach. Good morning to you, he says to the princess. Well, now, she said, I don't think it's such a good morning, actually. I'm about to be fit to a fiery serpent, Jack. Well, that's as maybe, says Jack. We shall see. But, you know, if this is to be your last time, you may as well make the most of it. And she looked at Jack and you know, with his twinkly eyes and his cheery smile and his curls, there was something about him that just kind of, kind of did something. And she thought, well, maybe, maybe I can just try and be in the minute and enjoy this time remaining to me. And so they skipped stones together. And they had rock throwing competitions to see who could throw their rock the furthest. And they talked and they talked and they talked about all kinds of things. And after a time, I don't know if it was because she was made bold with the possibility she was going to die imminently. But the princess said, Jack, do you think maybe I could have just one little lock of your curly hair and he took out the pocket knife and he cut off his hair and he gave it to the princess and she took it and she tucked it down inside her bosom oh and it was such a beautiful bosom and they looked at each other and it was at that moment that the fiery serpent raised its enormous head up from the ocean and stared at them. It opened its huge mouth and fire shot out and steam rose like a little mist cloud and drifted over them. And the princess stood and shocked Ah, oh, as the fiery serpent began to drag its huge body up out of the ocean towards the princess, licking out its forked tongue as it came. 
And Jack, he took from his pocket the ball and he closed his eyes and had a thought. And he threw the ball and it hit the fiery serpent in the middle of the head and it killed over and died. And now Jack, quick as lightning, he went over to the fiery serpent. He took his pocket knife and he cut out the tongue, the long forked tongue of the fiery serpent, and he stuffed it into his pocket. As the princess watched on in disbelief. And then he bowed to the princess and he said, I will always remember this day. And away he went, whistling. And now you remember the butler. The butler was watching from up on the headland. And the butler saw an opportunity. He came running as fast as his somewhat decrepitness would allow. And he arrived on the beach and he looked at the fiery sea serpent's corpse and he looked at the princess and he said, oh princess, I have saved you. Come along, we must tell the king. And so he brought the princess, who was still feeling rather shocked by the whole affair, to the village where everyone was gathered to hear the news. And when the king heard and saw his daughter was still alive, he said, bravo, and all the people cheered, hooray. And it was agreed that indeed the old butler should marry the princess on that very day. And so people came from all far and wide. A wonderful wedding feast was made. She was dressed in even more fancy, beauteous clothing. And everyone gathered for the wedding. But with all these witnesses there, the princess stepped forward and she said, I will not marry the butler. The butler did not kill the fiery serpent. And what's more, I will only marry the man that I love. And she took from her bosom the curly locket of Jack's hair. And she held it out and she said, the man that I love and will marry matches this curl. If he can be found, then there will be a wedding. Well, you can imagine all the young men that had come, the knights, the nobles, the wealthy men, they all gathered, they lined up to see, did the hair match their hair? But one after another, no, it did not. And then a woman came forward, a woman that we would recognize is the woman that was the servant of the three-headed giant, the very same one who had given him the magic ball. And she said, I recognize that curl. Why, that curl I am sure belongs to Jack. Jack? The crowd murmured, Jack, Jack, who's Jack? Call Jack, Jack, where is Jack? Bring him forward, Jack. And so Jack was pushed forward through the crowd until he stood in front of the princess. And she held up the locket of hair and all could see that yes, this was the man and that they were the two that should wed. And they could tell it not only by the hair, but by the way they looked at each other. But the king, the king, he was enraged. What, this man? This man, he is nothing more than a peasant. He looks after my cows. He comes from who knows where. And his brothers, his brothers are in my dungeons. I will not allow this man to marry my daughter. Well, the princess, she said. But he is the man that killed 
a fiery serpent. And he has proof, don't you, Jack? And Jack took out his pocket. And from the pocket, he pulled the forked tongue. And he laid it before the king. And he pulled out one, two, three tongues of the three headed giant and he laid those before the king and everyone stood in awe and silence and then a cheer went up as you have never heard jack jack they cried jack must marry the princess hooray for jack and even the old king he bowed he said, I was wrong. You may marry my daughter and in time rule this land. Ah, says Jack, very good. I would love to marry your daughter, but first I want to see my old mom. And so they took time and they sent a carriage with horses off to the farm. And there they got his old mom, who sat in the carriage, and surrounded. Oh, she was, she was beside herself. What was all this happening? And she came to the town where the wedding was taking place. Oh, oh my Lord. Oh, oh my heart. Oh, for there was her beloved Jack. And not only Jack, but Bill and Tom, who had come from the dungeons to be part of the wedding. My sons, she said, and to boot, a princess as a daughter-in-law? Well, it was a fine wedding, a wonderful wedding. Feasting went on for days. And that, that mom, she was given a little cottage on the property. And you know, even when he was really busy ruling the kingdom, Jack would still come over. And he'd say to mom, now mom, you put your feet up now. I'll put the kettle on and we'll have a cup of tea. And that's the end. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Catherine, thanks so much. That was absolutely brilliant. That story's got everything. I mean, who needs Hollywood, you know? <laughs> When you got stories like that, that's that, that's fabulous. You know, you wonder sometimes, and 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 again, sort of makes my point about what I was saying about all the jack tales that we have in the in the province as well. So that's great. One of these times, we'll have to do a festival of just jack tales and 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 see how many we can uh, come up with. It kind of uh, you know begs the question. I wonder where how a lot of them got made up. You know, and I, I remember my father telling me, well, it's, at, at times when he worked in lumber camps, when they used to sit around and and. One of the things they did to pass away at the time was make up stories, and each one would try to tell a bigger lie than the one before him. And uh, I, I'm going to sing you a little song just uh, about that. And this, actually, this song actually would have come uh, to Newfoundland from the west country of England with some of the early settlers who, uh, who you know, the early Europeans who, who arrived here, many of them who settled a, a large part of the settlers on the Newfoundland coast came from the west country. Uh, I got it from a singer in Rocky Harbor, a fellow by the name of George Decker. And, and uh, he calls it a tale of jests, but I found it also in the UK where they call it the, the lying song. But uh, this is the tale of jests. Oh, when I was a little boy to London I did go. I climbed on yonder steeple, my value for to show. My head I left in Westminster, my heels I let hang down. I jumped over Piccadilly and I never touched the ground. I sung fa da diddle little la 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 right fa la da -li day before I reached a London town, a lofty giant I spied. He looked down upon me and he spoke as I passed by. He then began to challenge me to wrestle, fight, or run. I beat him out at all his games and I killed him when I'd done. I sung fa la 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 right fa la la day. 
the people of this town oh they could not understand how to get that lofty giant away out of their land i picked him up by the nape of the neck and his heels i let hang down i gave him a flick with all my might and i flicked him out of the town i sung father diddle la 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 right father all i day they thank me for my favor likewise for what i'd done they gave me gold and silver about five hundred ton so then i made a little box about eight acres square in it I put my gold and silver and guineas laid so fair. I sung father diddle diddle la la la, right father all I day. Then I set out for Turkey, I traveled there by ox. And in my breeches pocket I put my little box. But when I came to the turkey shore, they turned me from the door. They would not let me in the court because I was so poor. I sung father diddle diddle la la la, right father all I day. So then I bought a flock of sheep and all of them were weathers. Sometimes they yield me very good wool, more times they yield me feathers. But of all the sheep in London town, there's none like like mine to increase for every month at the full of the moon they'll yield ten lambs apiece i sung father diddle diddle la 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 right father la la day so then i bought a little hen of her i took great care i set her in a mussel shell she brought me forth a hare this hare grew up to a milk white steed about fourteen lanyards high and if you tell a bigger jest i'm sure you tell a lie i sung father diddle diddle la 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 right father la la day i sung father diddle diddle la 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 right father la la day Right, a tale of jests. Okay, so moving on to our next storyteller. Our next storyteller. Touring Japan and then since Japan, Romania and South America and Taiwan and lots of other places in between. And one of the things that I like to do is work with strings, so string figures. I was introduced to this as a kid, many of us were. And this is the first shape I learned. I learned it in grade four during math class with my friend Betsy sitting beside me. We called it Jacob's Ladder. And I thought of it as simply Jacob's Ladder, a kid's game, a girl's game. And it wasn't until many years later that I learned that these string figures actually come from cultures all around the world. So like stories, like folk tales, they have, they travel around, they they change around and you get like the jacktails in Newfoundland, the jacktails in Appalachia, the jacktail equivalent is Les Histoires de Petit Jean in Quebec. Um, so with the string figures, you can have a shape that also travels around. Here's a really common string figure shape. This, when I was a kid, we learned this as a witch's broom. But then later I learned that in some areas in the South Pacific Islands, it's a fish spear, same shape, but just a different meaning. And in Africa, it's taught as a, a tree. So I'd like to integrate these, this variety of string figures into my performances of story of folk tales from various places as well. So it's a bit of an eclectic mishmash. And I'm going to start off with a story about a fool. I love stories about fools. There's something about today's world that calls to us to learn about fools because yes, that's right, they are out there. Uh, we have villages, mythic villages in many cultures with it, like the, the Helm, the stories from the village of Helm in the Yiddish tradition, the wise men of Gotham in France, there's a town called Charou, and these are low, mythic locations where people will do things like capture the, the gophers that are wrecking the garden, they'll capture them and then to punish them, they bury them alive, that sort of thing. But this one, this particular story is an individual. It's not a whole village, it's an individual. It's a story from India. His name is Dandaka. And Dandaka lived in a small house. And it was a perfect house for one person. 
but he didn't live alone. So that's what made it tricky. That tiny little house, just right for one, but it was very crowded because Dandaka lived with a whole bunch of friends. And he got tired of how crowded and squinchy it was. So Dandaka said one day, I'm going off, I'm gonna go in the woods, I'm gonna cut some wood and build my own house. His friends tried to talk him out of it. They said, Dandaka, no, you can't, you can't just go off like that. We, this is your home. Not anymore, says Dandaka. And off he went. Now, Dandaka went into the forest where he walked and walked and walked until he came to this tree, right? There's the tree. And he spotted this particular branch and said that that's the branch he wanted for building the start of his own house. Now, the tree was too tall for him to reach that branch, but that's not a problem. Dandaka said, I will just climb up that tree and I will cut the branch. So he put the saw over his shoulder. He went to the base of the tree and he put his arms around the trunk and he put his foot up and he climbed. He climbed and climbed and climbed and he climbed and climbed and climbed and climbed and climbed, and climbed all the way up. It was higher than he expected, actually, until he came to that particular branch right there. So he sat on the branch and he took his saw. I told you, it's a fool story. He took his saw and began to cut. Of course, it's not going to work very well. The branch broke, Dandaka fell to the ground. As it turns out, he fell on a soft part of the dirt below. He was fine. But looking up into the tall branches of that tree, he thought to himself, ah, oh, I fell so far, I must be dead. So he just lay there on the ground, not moving, not making any attempt to get up because he said to himself, dead people don't get up and go home. So he stayed there. Now, meanwhile, the day was coming to a close and back at the house, Dandaka's friends stepped outside as they did every day to gaze at the light of the sun, the setting sun. And then they said, it's time to go have our, uh-oh, wait a minute, where's Dandaka? You guys, ah, they had to go find him. They knew he needed help. He couldn't, he just needed help. So off they go into the forest and they search high and low for Dandaka and they find him. He's lying there on the ground, not moving. They checked him out. No broken bones, no bleeding, heart rate fine, he's breathing, but they couldn't get a word out of him. What happened, Dandaka? What are you doing here? What's, what's going on? What are you doing? Dandaka said to himself, dead people don't answer questions. So he said nothing. Now you know that Dandaka is not the brightest fellow around, but he had the special wisdom, the deep wisdom to gather around him good people. And those were his friends. So his friends looked after him. They took sticks and twigs and pieces of twine and they made this little beer, a little stretcher. They laid him carefully on top of that and they carried him back through the forest all the way down the path back to the house. They laid it down and they left him alone for the night while they all slept. In the morning, Dandaka still wouldn't move. But one of his friends said, I have a plan. I have a plan. And so he boiled up a batch of Dandaka's favorite spicy lentil dal and he poured a nice bowl of it set it on a plate and he put that bowl right beside dandaka where he lay on the ground dandaka lying there believing he's dead inhaling the vapors of that soup oh mm, darn too bad i'm dead Darn, but then he realized if he could still smell and if he could feel hunger, maybe, maybe, maybe he was still alive. So he tried it out. 
he opened his eyes, he sat up, he took a bowl, he took the bowl and he took a sip of soup and it was delicious. And his friends to their enormous credit never laughed at him. They never made fun of him. They said, Dandaka, we're so happy to have you back. Dandaka decided that even though the house was a little crowded, actually very crowded, it was the best place to live because he realized he really liked his friends. And then he decided that the woods were nice too. And it was nice to go out for walks in those woods. And one day when he was out walking in the woods, he found this little, this little orphan dog out there. And that little dog saw him and ran right up to him. And the dog and Dandaka walked in the woods every day from then on. And that's pretty much how Dandaka and all his friends lived, I'd say, pretty happily ever after. The end. So there's one story interweaving with the string figures. And since I know that you are just, just like burning with curiosity, you just really want to learn one simple, simple string game before I tell you another story. One super simple string trick. Some of you have done Cat's Cradle as a kid, right? And some of you have made these shapes before. Some of you have probably been at workshops I've led or shows have done and so on. And uh, I'm gonna teach you a really easy trick. This one comes from, it, it's, I'm sure it exists in many places around the world. I found it in a collection of string figures that was, was, that was collected um, by a Russian anthropologist on the west coast of Vancouver Island in the early 1900s. So here we go. I'm gonna take the string, I'm gonna put it under my leg, like this. There it is. So with the string under the leg, now you have it on your thumbs, baby fingers, so it's across each palm. And then you pick up with the right hand first, index, index. You'll remember all this, I know you will. Lay the strings down on your leg, pull your two thumbs out, like that. Pull your right pinky out, like that. Your left index out, like that, and pull your hands apart and the string goes right through your leg. So here it is again, under the leg, thumb, 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 thumbs, pinky, index, et voila. You'll have a chance to practice that. And it's somewhere on YouTube. I have a video of that one in my various string videos. So, um, Dandaka, I was also going to tell a story from Burma. This is a story about, uh, it sort of speaks to the necessity of uh, thinking about how to answer questions and thinking about what's the right thing to say in given circumstances. This is a story about a tiger. And the tiger is king of the entire forest. But it's a big job. The tiger says, I need an assistant. That assistant will be tiger's minister of state. And that was a very prestigious title. And the job had great benefits too. And it was a beautiful spring day. There was pollen and optimism in the air. So three animals came up right away to apply for that job. The first was a wild boar. The second was a chicken and the third was a rabbit. The, can the, the candidates lined up. The tiger looked them over and the tiger said, I, am looking for someone who knows how to say the right thing at the right time. The wild boar stepped forward. Majesty, that's me. I can do that. Take me. And the chicken came up. I can do that, Majesty. I can do that. And the rabbit. Oh, Majesty, I, 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 I'm the one you want for that. The tiger just looked at them and said, we shall see who, if anyone, knows how to say the right thing at the right time. With those words, the tiger stepped up to the first candidate, the boar. He opened his mouth wide and he breathed his hot, stinky tiger breath right in the boar's face. How does my breath smell? Is it 
the wheat? The boar. The boar had always been taught the right thing to say is always, always the truth. Ugh, phew, majesty, that stinks. Woof, the breath smells worse than, oh, worse than rotten fish. Oh, that's bad. Oh, pew. The tiger looked at the boar. You insult me and I do not like that. So the tiger pounced on the boar. He ripped him limb from limb and he devoured him. And then he spit out the bones. Now, you might understand that this left the other two candidates a little bit uneasy about the job application for this, the application procedure for this posting. No time for such thoughts, however, the tiger stepped up to the second candidate, the chicken. How does my breath smell. Is it <sighs> sweet? To be honest, the tiger's breath had been pretty bad to start with. On top of that, he'd just eaten a wild boar. It really was not good. However, the chicken had seen the way things went for the boar. She was not going to make the same mistake. Oh, uh, 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 <laughs> The tiger looked at the chicken. You, you try to flatter me with your lies, and I do not tolerate such foul play. So the tiger pounced on the chicken. He ripped her wing from limb, pulled out all the feathers, and he devoured her. <sighs> Spit out the bones, leaving one candidate, the rabbit. For the rabbit, it was as if time stood still. The tiger came forward. How does my breath smell? Is it sweet? The rabbit just froze. Around him, the forest air stirred, dust, pollen from the air, little bit of wind. And in the distance, in the distance, he heard the sounds, the rustling of leaves in the trees. And he heard the call of a bird. A bird as it flew by. And the rabbit flipped back in time. He went right back in time to a moment in his childhood when he had said to his parents with all the enthusiasm and innocence of youth, he said, mom, dad, when I grow up, I'm gonna be an artist. I'm gonna be a musician or a painter or a, or a recitationist or I'm gonna be a storyteller, or yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be an artist. And his parents said, son, no, you have to get a real job. And so the rabbit had put aside his passion for creative expression, and instead he had taken a job 
with the local government and he'd spent his days, weeks, months, years in this job, pushing papers around and sitting in a chair. And now trying for a new job, but he wished he wished with all his heart that instead he'd follow his dream. He could be a touring artist. He might be in Paris right now or even far away, Egypt. Yes, no, no. Instead, he was looking into the tiger's mouth, looking at his sure demise, and he was frozen. Uh, 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 don't, I, uh, I don't know what, <laughs> even all those years working at a job he didn't love, even all those years had not taken away the artist and the creative's what little spark inside him. And there it was, he was an improviser. Uh, Majesty, I, uh, I, I seem to have a cold, uh, and therefore I'm uh, temporarily disabled with respect to my olfactory faculties. <laughs> yes, uh, and so I cannot pronounce upon the precise condition of your breath at this moment, but perhaps uh, I could submit a report at a later uh, date. Uh, Majesty, uh, 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 at two. Mm -hmm. The tiger looked at the rabbit. You, you, you know how to say the right thing at the right time. And that, my friends, is how the rabbit went through this hair raising experience and became the tiger's minister of state. The end. Wow, that's great. And thanks so much. That's the wonderful illustrated storytelling of Anne Glover, all the way from BC. Thanks so much for joining us for the St. John's Storytelling Festival. And uh, we've pretty much come to the end of the program uh, here uh, tonight. I want to thank everybody for tuning in and sticking with us through it. I want to uh, thank the sponsors again, Arts NL, Canada Council for the Arts, the Federal Department of Canadian Heritage, the City of St. John's, and the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. I want to thank uh, Kaylee Bryan, who with some help from Rebecca Nolan has really made this whole thing happen this evening. Fantastic job, you guys. Thanks, thanks so much. And of course, I want to thank our special guests, our, our tellers, uh, Ann Glover, who you just heard, Jan Blake, Catherine Wright, and Sharon King Campbell. Just uh, a real pleasure to be able to share the screen with all you guys uh, tonight. Now, um, we've mentioned a couple of times, normally, you know, the St. John's Storytelling Festival, of course, is doing live events and charging ticket prices. So everybody you know, a lot of arts organizations these days are struggling to make it along on a wing and a prayer. So if you can uh, see uh, an opportunity to, uh, you know, to make an online donation to the Storytelling Festival, that will ensure other events will take place. And uh, the last Wednesday of every month features another, uh, another episode of the St. John Storytelling Festival. So uh, we hope you'll join us. Uh, you'll join us again. Now, uh, I'm going to repeat the riddle one more time. I haven't got it. And I don't want it. But if I had it, I wouldn't part with it for the world. Uh, so you uh, think about that, send along your answer. And uh, if you get the right answer, we'll be in touch with your door prize. Now I'm going to leave you with this last little piece of tomfoolery here. Um, you know, these days they call it folklore. But when I was growing up, they just used to refer to it as old foolishness. People going on with their old foolishness. And this is a, a little sort of a toast, a tongue twister, a little benediction. Uh, that a, the late Cyril Drover told me one night and uh, when I was doing a gig in a little tiny spot on the edge of the Bayvert Peninsula called Fleur de Lis, called the Crooked Crab Tree, and it goes like this. And thanks again for tuning in, everybody, and uh, we we'll hope to see you again. Here's to the Crooked Crab Tree. 
Here's to the grass that grows around the crooked crab tree. Here's to the cow with the crooked horn that eat the crooked grass that grows around the crooked crab tree. And here's to the woman with the crooked arm, the milk the crooked cow with the crooked horn that eat the crooked grass that grows around the crooked crab tree. Now here's to the man with the crooked leg, who married the crooked woman with the crooked arm, the milk the crooked cow with the crooked horn that eat the crooked grass that grows around the crooked crab tree. And here's to the minister with the crooked book, who married the crooked man with the crooked leg, to the crooked woman with the crooked arm, the milk the crooked cow with the crooked horn that eat the crooked grass that grows around the crooked crab tree. Now here's to the tailor with the crooked needle, who sewed a crooked suit of clothes for the crooked minister, with the crooked book, who married a crooked man with a crooked leg, to the crooked woman with a crooked arm, the milk, the crooked cow, the crooked horn, eat the crooked grass, grows around the crooked crab tree. And here's to the rooster with the crooked crow, who wrote the crooked tailor with the crooked needle, who sold a crooked suit of clothes for the crooked minister, with the crooked book, who married a crooked man with a crooked leg, to the crooked woman with a crooked arm, the crooked cow, the crooked horn, eat the crooked grass, grows around the crooked crab tree. And here's to the dog with the crooked bark. Who woke the crooked rooster with the crooked crow, woke the crooked tailor with the crooked needle, who sold the crooked suit of clothes for the crooked minister, with the crooked book, who married the crooked man with the crooked leg, to the crooked woman, the crooked arm, the crooked cow, the crooked horn, eat the crooked grass, goes around the crooked crab tree. And here's to the rest of you. Safe home, everybody.